Welcome chemistry students, it's Mr. Gopal here uh, with another lesson about basics of atomic structure. So in this lesson, it's pretty cool. We use what we call a FET simulation, which is provided by the excellent science professors at the University of Colorado. It's basically an animation that will introduce you to the nuts and bolts of an atom. And the focus question we have today is, how can we use a simulation to add to our understandings of atoms and subatomic particles? And so more specifically, we wanna make atom models that show stable atoms or ions and use given information about subatomic particles to identify an element and its position on the periodic table. We'll get into that shortly. We're gonna draw models of atoms uh, and determine if the model is for what we call a neutral atom or just an atom versus an ion of an element. Okay. And then finally, you want to be able to predict the results of making certain changes, uh, the addition or subtraction of a proton, neutron, or electron, how it's going to change the element, some uh, changes, specifically changes that happen with the addition or removal of electrons. We are going to discuss in greater depth. In later units, you're going to understand the overall or net change when you adjust the protons or the neutrons. And so before we get into the simulation itself, I wanna take a look at this document that I made. So one of the things that I'm very passionate about in this unit is making sure that students really understand vocabulary from unit one and then basic vocabulary from unit two. If you can't move forward and speak using um, the various terms that we're gonna use over and over again in the course, then you'll get more lost. So it's really important to understand what we're talking about. So First of all, we're going to start at the absolute ground floor by defining matter. Matter, as we described in the previous unit, is any substance that has mass and takes up space or volume. So we identified things that are and aren't matter. For example, this pencil right here, that is matter. It has some mass. It does take up some space. On the other hand, fire fails the test. While it does take up space, it has a certain volume, it has no mass, all right? So we need another way to describe something like fire. It is a form of energy, which we'll get into further in physics. Um, so that's your brief introduction to matter. Now for the atom. So the atom is the smallest unit of matter that contains all the chemical characteristics of that matter. And I wanna focus on this a little bit longer. Um, so for our purposes, I say in my document, that means that it has the complete and characteristic subatomic particles of a chemical element. We're gonna delve into that deeper by looking again at this pencil. So you can see if I zoom in on this pencil, all right, uh, it has a tip. And we know that tip is made out of graphite. That is a material that we write with. And down the line, you'll realize that graphite is made out of carbon. And carbon is a part of pretty much everything that we see around us. We ourselves, are largely made up of carbon. That's why we call ourselves carbon-based uh, carbon life forms, all right? Um, all of the organic matter or living matter that we consume, whether it's plants or animals, happens to be made out of carbon as well. But it would surprise you to know just how small the atom is. Now, we know we can't see it with the naked eye, but it would probably surprise you to know that if I were to write my signature with this pencil, I would write um, out a signature in graphite, a form of carbon, again, that is roughly one times 10 to the 21st um, atoms. And that means that I take that one and I add 21 zeros after it, all right? And uh, that, uh, if you can imagine, you know, if I get to a billion, I have a one with nine zeros after it, adding on, 12 more zeros after that. And that would give you how many carbon atoms there are in just my signature. I'm not even talking about filling a piece of paper with a bunch of notes. So we know that atoms are incredibly tiny, all right? Uh, and so we can break down matter again and again and again and still retain all of its chemical characteristics. Now, why is it so important for us to understand um, the most basic building block of these elements? Well, it helps us predict a lot about their behavior. And we're gonna get into the very basics of that today. I'm sure you have lots of questions about what I just said. You know, I won't be able to answer all of them in this video, but we will get a solid introduction. So where I wanna start after that 
is with the term subatomic particle. Okay, so if we're thinking about prefixes, which you always should when you're in any course really, but in science courses, it's particularly important because there are important patterns to them. So if you think sub, you think under uh, or below, all right? So below the level of the atom, in other words, there are particles that are inside it. And I call these particles with fixed behaviors, all right? We're gonna talk more about that means, but first we're gonna talk about the structure of the atom uh, and where certain subatomic particles are contained. Uh, and two types of them are contained in the nucleus. The nucleus is the small, dense center of an atom. Uh, if we've studied our atomic models very carefully, we know that Rutherford did the, uh, the gold foil experiment. And one of the major outcomes is that by firing positively charged particles at a gold foil, he saw that most of those particles went straight through the foil, leading him to believe that atoms do not take up a lot of space. And actually there's a lot of empty space in there, believe it or not. So they're so tiny. And even within that, the nucleus is just a very dense, tiny center. Uh, and around them, there's a lot of space. You're probably wondering, well, wait a minute. If that's the case, why doesn't it look like the gold foil is like a piece of Swiss cheese with huge holes in it? Well, the reason why is that even though these atoms are mostly made up of empty space. They're so incredibly tiny. Again, I'm gonna go back to that number one times 10 to the 21st atoms in a piece of graphite in your signature, all right? Um, to tell you that even though there's mostly empty space around them, there are so many of them, they're so packed together that still, when we talk about these particles that we fired through them, those particles in and of themselves are microscopic. We can't really see them very well. Um, so I'm sure you got loads of questions about how it is that scientists have just made all these brilliant discoveries. And again, I'm not gonna be able to answer them today, but I am gonna show you how we can use our knowledge of subatomic particles to predict trends in the ways that elements behave. So inside this small dense center, we have protons and neutrons, and that's why it's so dense. Protons and neutrons, as you can see from my definitions, are positively and neutrally charged respectively. So a proton is positively charged, a neutron has no charge. Both of them have roughly equal masses. The mass of a neutron is slightly greater. Of the three subatomic particles, the neutron is the most massive, mean, meaning it has the most mass, all right? Electrons, on the other hand, are not inside the nucleus, they're outside of it. So if I'm making a basic drawing, a very crude drawing, let's say of a hydrogen atom, we're gonna have one proton and one electron inside this nucleus. Let me do that in a different color. One proton, one neutron. And then we're gonna have, I'll change the color to red for contrast. We're gonna have an electron orbiting here, all outside. So I'm actually gonna undo that to remind us that it's a small dense center that is the atom and way out here maybe, even this is probably not to scale. My, uh, my nucleus should be way, way smaller. But out here, I'll put it in green again. I'll have one electron orbiting, all right? And this is, this is like our Bohr model of the atom, which you may or may not have studied in your atomic models. If you haven't, it's the model on which we base this course, okay? Uh, and it's a very, in many ways, a very accurate model. Uh, of atomic behavior and structure. So we have an electron out there. It weighs far less, all right, because it has less mass than a proton or a neutron, and it orbits the nucleus. It is outside of it. Finally, I want to talk about atoms versus ions. So we sometimes put the word neutral before atoms to describe them in one context, in their uh, given context, you could say. And the reason we say that is because they're neutral with respect to overall charge. Now here, if a proton has a positive charge, and right, I'm gonna put a plus sign next to this proton, and a neutron has a, or sorry, a neutron has no charge, put that in a different color, zero, so it doesn't contribute to our charge. And then an electron has a negative charge, I'm gonna put a minus sign out here with the electron. Then I have one plus negative one, and my overall charge is zero. And that's the state of most atoms at the beginning. However, as we see throughout the course, chemical bonding occurs, all right? Atoms either transfer or share electrons. 
leading them to either have regions that have different charges or to actually acquire um, an ion, meaning acquire an overall charge, all right? Uh, in the case of ionic bonding, which you'll go on to study in future units, um, when they transfer an electron out, they will have an overall positive charge because they will have fewer electrons than protons. On the other hand, if they bring an electron in, if they add an electron, they will have an overall negative charge because they will have more electrons than protons. And again, to get the overall charge, we add the amount of protons with a positive uh, sign to the number of electrons with a negative sign. And if we have an unequal outcome, that means that we have an ion. And that means that this element now has a charge or its atoms have a charge. It is turned from a neutral atom to an ion. So let's explore a little bit how the simulation takes us through this. So we're gonna build these atoms and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what it is that we're seeing, all right? So as you can see, if I drag in uh, a proton in here, it is already an ion. And that's because I have one proton in the center, but I have no electrons outside. And if I drag a neutron in here, it's still an ion because I have still not made its charge or its overall charge equal zero. So now I drag in an electron and I have a neutral atom. And I'm over here at the top left, the very beginning of my periodic table. And I know the atomic number of this hydrogen is one. And the, that atomic number relates to the number of protons in this atom. Okay, and this is why we are always adjusting the number of electrons in order to create ions. If we adjust the number of protons, as you can see, when I do this, we will have a new type of element. So I drag another proton in, and now I have helium, which has an atomic number of two directly related to the number of protons that it has. If I drag in another neutron, it's not gonna change the, the atom, the element. All right, if I drag in an electron, now it becomes neutral. So, so I've shown you how to make a neutral atom. Now, if I drag in a new electron, note that it goes to the second orbital, all right? And now I have a negatively charged atom for the first time. At first I had, or a negative, negative ion for the first time. At first I had positive ions, all right? So now I have three electrons and two protons that makes a net charge of negative one, which means I have a negative ion. So we've seen how we can adjust and make uh, negative and positive ions. As you see, when I tr try to balance this out by adding more protons, I'm gonna change the element. Now it becomes lithium. And now it will become beryllium because I have four protons and beryllium's atomic number is four. And so you can see this box up here, sorry, over here where I'm hovering my, my mouse. You can see that change as I add more protons, I'm going across this. Let's stop at carbon because it's such an important element. Uh, it's a positive um, ion right now because I have six protons now and I have four electrons. So let me get this back to neutral. And now I have six electrons orbiting here. So we are good, we are neutral. However, this is an unrealistic amount of neutrons because neutrons tend to come in about the same amount as the protons and electrons. So I'm gonna get this up to six. And this is like our perfectly balanced, if you will, carbon atom, six protons, six neutrons on the nucleus, and then six electrons orbiting that nucleus. Now let's see what happens if I start to add more neutrons. Now at first, nothing is really going to happen. And maybe I can even get to the point where I add all these. But now let's see what happens if I start to pull out more and more protons. Huh. So, oh, I forgot to check off the stable or unstable box. So let me do that again. I'm going to refresh and let's do it from the top. So I've got a hydrogen atom. It's an ion right now. Actually, it's a positive ion. It's still a positive ion. Now it's neutral. I'm going to start adding more and more electrons, but check off this box related to stable or unstable. So the moment that I add more neutrons, all right, 
um, we create instability. And you can see that that instability is in the nucleus. Now, we're not going to talk about this in this particular unit. But for now, suffice it to say that there are really interesting properties that come out of changing the amount of neutrons. Even though they don't have a charge, because they have the most weight, they can lead to instability and some very interesting uh, chemical reactions with some very interesting outcomes. Um, nuclear energy, in part, is based on some of the properties of adding and subtracting neutrons from different elements. So I'm going to pause it there with the simulation. I'll just refresh it to go back to neutral. And let's go back to here and talk about some of the independent work. So if we think about it, we just went over what makes the center of the atom stable or unstable. We have a good idea from my document as well as the simulation and my discussion of what's inside the nucleus. Um, and then we figured out a simple way to track which element it is, and that's related to the amount of protons inside. That means you shouldn't have too much trouble uh, making or answering these rules. What's the rule for making a neutral atom with no charge? Well, we know that that's related to the number of protons and electrons and something about them. What's the rule for making a positive ion, which has a positive charge? We know um, we can do that by adjusting the amount of electrons. Uh, and you have to remember, do I remove them? Do I add more in? So in this lesson, we covered the basics of atomic structure. We described the difference between a neutral atom and an ion. We talked about protons, neutrons, and electrons, their relative weights, and also their charges. We talked about the nucleus and where the electrons orbit. And then finally, we classified protons, neutrons, and electrons as types of subatomic particles. And all of this goes under the umbrella of matter, which again, is any substance that has mass and takes up space or volume. I hope this has all been very helpful to you. Hold on to this vocabulary, hold on to this document and organize it in a place of prominence in your notes because it will come up time and time again. Uh, and I will talk to you very soon.